Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, talk about the open source AI dilemma. Uh, today, we will discuss a few things. My name is Ofer Ramoni. I am part of the Linux Foundation AI since we started this foundation. So I uh, have uh, quite a lot of uh, background here. And we started the Linux Foundation AI in 2018. Uh, I was also the first tech chair, so a lot of uh, background. And currently leading the Generative AI Commons Education and Outreach. Uh, and on top of that, I am working with the OSI, which Mary is uh, representing, representing here, uh, about the open source AI definition. And we all know that uh, we, we all know about open source software, which is easy, but open source AI or open source AI models is way more complex, and this is what we, are, we will talk about today. Before that, I will start. Okay, so we know that we know the definition of open source software for many years, mm -hmm. and it's easy, it, it, it defined more uh, easily. But uh, open source AI, open source AI models, this is way more complex, and we will explain why. Thank you for the cl clarification. So I'll start with the, uh, a little bit uh, uh, background about Linux Foundation AI. Uh, then I will explain about, uh, I'll share about the uh, Generative AI Commons, which is part of Linux Foundation AI. Then we'll discuss one of the activities that we are doing there, which is the Model Openness Framework. And then Mayor will take the lead and will present the process that we are doing at uh, uh, open source uh, uh, initiative. And then we will have uh, some open discussion about shall we even open source AI or not, or how we will do it, and so on. So let's start about uh, a little bit about Linux Foundation AI. So Linux Foundation AI is like many other organization, umbrella organizations within Linux Foundation. Um, and our goal is to uh, uh, share and work on open source AI. Um, the structure of uh, the organization, and it may have changed in the uh, past few weeks, but uh, in any case, we have projects, and then we have all the governing uh, bodies. Uh, we have on the left the governing board and all the uh, different uh, committees. And then on the right side, which in my opinion is more interesting, is the Technical Advisory Council and all the activities that are more technical. Uh, so we have the Generative AI Commons, and I will explain more about that. And, and we have members of this uh, organization here uh, in the room. Uh, ML Ops, ML Workflow and Interop, ML Security, DNAI, and Data Ops. And this committee is basically uh, uh, we meet, discuss, and, and educate the, uh, the projects or educate the uh, entire industry. Some uh, statistics about the Linux Foundation AI. So we started it in March, I think, 18, uh, more than uh, six years ago. We currently have 64 projects. Maybe it's not fully updated. On Thursday, we accepted another project that was uh, introduced today in the keynote uh, by Intel. Uh, 650 contributing uh, organizations, uh, 75 members, uh, organizations, uh, many, many millions of lines of codes, uh, more than 100,000 contributors across the years, across the, uh, all projects that we are uh, hosting. 30 of them active last year, like the last uh, uh, 12 months and 250,000 GitHub stars across the, the project. So it's pretty, pretty big. When we started it in 2018, we had one project, which uh, uh, it's funny, but it was some kind of a, a, a hugging face project. Same idea. Uh, this project is no longer uh, active, but now we have so many other projects and so much energy in the organization. So we started slow and, and of course, AI is, is growing, and the interest in what we are doing is really amazing. 
here is a, 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 like a picture with all the, uh, not all, but most of the projects that uh, we are hosting. And uh, you don't even need to take a picture. I will in a minute show you something, a, to, a very cool tool that you can see everything and play with it. Uh, some industry leaders, not all of that are, uh, um, that host projects, not all of them are members yet, but I assume uh, we will get everyone in. <laughs> um, and this is the cool tool. I hope you can scan the, uh, the QR code. This is basically a, an interactive uh, uh, landscape with all the projects uh, that we have, open source projects uh, that we have on, uh, um, uh, in AI, um, 60, how many? 64, I said, of them should be with a blue box, which means that they are uh, uh, part of uh, LFAI. Um, and you can play with it, like you can uh, uh, filter different things and, and see it in different ways. So I encourage you to try it. And now let's, uh, let me go back. So we, we said that we have different uh, activities. I would like to focus now on the generative AI. Let me, this one, the generative AI commons. I don't know what I've done, but this, okay. Um, so the Generative AI Commons is basically a working group or a, 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 a committee that is focused on open source Generative AI, of course. Uh, we have many, many uh, active uh, members, like hundreds now, uh, with more than 80 organizations that are participating in this uh, activity. In order to participate in this, you don't have to be a member, like you don't have to represent a member uh, a company. You can be like, like myself, just contribute, join the, the, join the meeting, uh, uh, produce uh, uh, content and uh, move our goals uh, forward. Um, we are organized, you wanted this one, I don't know. And we will upload the slides for sure. Uh, so we are organized in five uh, uh, work streams, uh, applications, model, uh, models and data, frameworks, responsible AI, and education and outreach. Um, between those uh, uh, um, work streams, we are welcoming everyone to join. We need more technical people on the uh, model and data and application. And we can get, or we are, we will be happy to have more contribution from others that are less technical and want to contribute in different ways. Um, I personally lead the Education and Outreach Committee, which is the best uh, committee. Uh, and we do a lot of activities, uh, like many, many activities. We, tomorrow we have a webinar, next week we have another one, and, and uh, uh, Annie is here, she will lead this, the, the, the second one. Um, so a lot of activities and you don't necessarily be, have to be uh, technical in order to contribute here. The responsible AI is basically a, a, phone, a, a, a committee that uh, started, uh, uh, Susan, are you here still? Yeah. When did we start uh, the Trusted AI Committee? Years ago. Years ago. And, and when we started the trust, it, it used to call Trusted AI Committee. And when we started the Trusted AI Committee, it was, some, somehow hard to get the meetings going. We, we, in, in many cases, we canceled meetings because we didn't have enough interest and, and enough participation. And in the past few months, it's mm -hmm. exploded. Everyone is coming and we, we are now, we switch to uh, two meetings a month rather than one a month. And, and a lot of activity, a lot of uh, contribution and interest. Uh, so this is a, a, another working group that I'm, um, pretty active in. And uh, the, the, the framework one, I wanted to uh, share with you something that we have done there uh, because it is relevant to the rest of the discussion. So basically one of the things that we, we have done there in the frameworks uh, uh, working group is to define the model openness framework. And the open uh, uh, model openness framework or the MOF is basically uh, our attempt to create some clarity in the industry about what is open and what is open AI. 
Uh, and this, this effort is, is not the effort that uh, Mary will uh, share with you, but it's kind of uh, um, um, combined in, in a way that you will see in, in a minute. Um, we basically uh, analyzed and defined all the uh, elements that are part of uh, uh, what is AI system or AI um, um, model. And we separated it into 16 elements. Uh, between all the elements, we have here um, data and, and model and code. And then on top of this, all the documentation associated with it. And try to, um, and, and basically uh, defined in a very interesting way, three classes. Each class uh, is defined uh, in a different way. So uh, what are the different elements that need to be open and to what extent? And then we have the class three, open model, class two, which is higher uh, uh, open tooling. And then like the top class is open science. And when we, uh, and when Mary will discuss the uh, open science, uh, the, the open source uh, initiative and, and the definition of open source, we will not get all the way up, but uh, uh, we will be a little bit more practical. Uh, any, any questions about uh, what we've seen so far? Okay, so Mary, you're... Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, am I on? I'm on, okay, great. Uh, so thank you so much. It's so great to see a full room here um, because we've been working on this for over a year. Uh, and yeah, great to see the rest of you all excited to learn more. So I'm going to talk about the open source AI definition. Sometimes we call it the OSAID in case you needed another acronym. <laughs> I try not to overload with the acronyms, but. Uh, and this is a project of the Open Source Initiative, or OSI, which is basically the, inst the authority on defining open source. And they're currently the stewards of the open source definition. So they evaluate uh, open source licenses. And then when that license is applied to, at this point, a piece of software, people say, I trust it as open source. Uh, and they're a nonprofit, and they have a global scope and an educational and advocacy <clears throat> mission, and as well as building bridges across multiple constituencies in open source, which of course there are, which we will talk about actually. Um, so yes, the 2024 goal for the uh, OS open source AI definition is to create it and to have a stable version by October. Um, how to create it? So I'm gonna talk about process, uh, most of what I'm talking about. Uh, that is because the definition for open source AI will have a global impact. And so it should be based on global input and how are we doing that? So we're using co-design, which is basically a set of creative methods for solving challenges by sharing knowledge and power. And you could imagine why that would seem appropriate for a definition of open source AI. And my company, which is called Do Be Good, hired by OSI to design and implement this co-design system, which I'll be talking about. Uh, why do we need a definition? I think we're all in the room because uh, we agree on that, even if we're not sure if AI should be open source. But just the idea that open source was created around software. Now we're wondering how does open source apply to this current technology, new technology AI. In five and 10, 20 years, it'll be another technology that we'll be looking at how does open source apply, but right now we're on AI. And then also uh, basically 100 flowers are blooming, everyone's going their own direction in defining open source AI. We have regulators such as the EU AI Act. We have in marketplaces like Hacking Face so many different open source licenses that creators are applying in good faith and there's just so many. Um, and also because there is this lack of clarity that favors those who scream the loudest, not the most competent or reasonable or representative of you know, the global population affected by AI, right? So uh, we thought, let's do better. 
Um, where are we now? Uh, we are on version 0.0.7 .0 of the definition, and that QR code will take you to our HackMD uh, instance, I guess, where you can make comments on the document and view it. Uh, there is a preamble about why it's necessary, some out of scope issues, the four freedoms for open source AI, and then a legal checklist of required and optional components according to our process. Um, the first part is done ish, I would say. I mean, it's still, we're still working on it, but we are currently focused on particularly the legal frameworks for the different components. Um, yeah, so fall 2023 is when I became involved and the co-design process began. Um, we started by looking at the four freedoms. Uh, what should these open source principles mean for artificial intelligence, right? Use, study, modify, share. We're familiar with them. How do they exist in this new context? And the way to be decided to answer that was that we had three uh, in-person co-design sessions at All Things Open in Raleigh, North Carolina, at the Linux Foundation Member Sub in Monterey, California, and then at the Digital Public Goods Alliance Member Meeting at Addis Ababa, um, Ethiopia. And what we came up with was this, and it should not surprise anyone, but this, these are the definitions of the terms that we're using for AI. So use the system for any purpose without asking permission, study the system and expect its components, which is what Ofer was calling elements, it's the same things, just using slightly different words. Um, modify the system for any purpose, including to change an output, share the system for others to use, obviously, uh, with or without modification, and again, for any purpose. Um, and then this winter, uh, we, asked, we began answering this question, the big, big question, what components must be open in order for an AI system to be used, studied, modified, and shared? And this is a very complex, controversial question, right? There are many differing and valid perspectives. Uh, so how do we go about answering this question? So we started again with in-person co-design sessions. We were at AI Dev in San Jose in California. And then we got some very reasonable feedback, which was if you're doing all your co-design in person, that's actually quite exclusionary because if you happen not to be at that event, you're not able to participate. And we thought, that's true. So we went to a virtual process and we created virtual working groups, um, again, to focus in on specifics and get out of the realm of theory. We formed our working groups around four AI systems with diverse approaches to openness. Right? And we could talk about what those diverse approaches are, but you can kind of scan down the list and get a sense of the parameters that we were thinking about. Um, and these are the work group members. Part of what they agreed to was to have their names and affiliations public, because again, this is a global decision and it matters who, who is making these decisions, who is most empowered. Um, and to, because we care about global representation, we conducted specific outreach to black, indigenous, and other people of color particularly women and individuals from the global south, and over 50% of work group participants are people of color. So what did this work group do? Um, we started with the model openness framework because it is, as Ofer said, just incredibly helpful foundational document of these elements, components, spectacular knowledge base that we were able to build on. Um, then what we did with that is we created kind of a voting procedure in each working group. So on the far left, you see the components, and then there's a question, is this component required to use, study, modify, share? And then people in the working groups, they voted and they voted by initial, again, for transparency. So you can see who is voting for what, who is saying what is essential. Um, I compiled these and made, again, this is, this is all public on the internet and linked, but on the far right, you can say I created, created a Likert, Likert scale um, according to the number of votes per component, which is that column total kind of in the middle that has that color code as well. And then if you're moving further to, yeah, to the left, you see the recommendation, which is just a direct correspondence to the total number of votes in that middle column. And then you can see the components. Um, posted that what components ended up in which categories to our public forum, which I'll be linking to later in the presentation for public comment. 
Um, and that is anyone. So you don't have to be a member of a working group. You just have to create an account so that we don't you know, get spammed. Um, and then we came up with uh, a version of our definition, but we kept moving. <laughs> and also, Afar was like, Mary, you can skip forward a little bit. So now we're at version 0 .0 0 0.0.7, and these are the required components. We have these four data components, and again, they could be categorized differently. You know, you see some commas, could they be separated? Yes, anyway, um, code model, and then we have data transparency documentation. Uh, we did not end up with uh, people voting for the data sets themselves as required components, and again, we can talk about that. This, again, QR code will take you to that, the full definition. And these are the legal frameworks for all those required components. Um, there's optional components as well. They're all would be available under OSI compliant licenses. The only outstanding question is at the bottom, you can see model parameters including weights available under terms compatible with open source principles means there's some debate as to whether um, model parameters and weights are copyrightable. So that's part of the licensing infrastructure that we will figure out for the next version. And I would love to talk more in the Q&A about representation, inclusion, and equity, which is just so important to this process, being legitimate, you know, global definition requiring global consultation. Uh, I'd love to talk about the different stakeholder groups, how we're thinking about our stakeholder groups beyond um, identity-based representations, who's involved at what points, how we're actually doing outreach to make sure that a range of identities are included in the decision-making process. Um, I will go now to our next steps. So we are going to release uh, our C1 uh, in June, and then we're gonna have a stable version in October. And these are the in-person events that we will be at, uh, if you would like to join us. Some of them we don't quite have dates yet, but you get a sense of where we'll be and when this summer. Um, and then we would love for you to stay connected and to join the process. So that QR code will take you to this forum, which you've seen me screenshot how we've been using that in our process to share what we're doing as we're doing it for public comment. And we also have bi-weekly virtual town halls. Um, one is for basically Europe, Africa, and the Americas. And then we flip to another time zone for the second one of the month, which is Asia. Um, so we are, yeah, we're being global as best we can. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. And now we go to the discussion. So thank you so much. Any any questions about the pro? Yeah. Thank you. A any questions about the the process about the OSI uh, activities? Yeah. To what extent philosophers or physicists could involved in any of this, or is this series of the panel with them technocrats? Hmm. Is that a loaded question? <laughs> Maybe know, repeat the question because question. it's... Oh, did everyone hear? Uh, so to what extent are philosophers and ethicists being involved as opposed to an alternative and obviously equally valid system of techno vision, of, of tunnel vision technocrats? Um, and I guess I would say that our goal is to include people that are coming to uh, the question from a range of perspectives. I believe we have a logician. One of the academics is a logician. Um, I don't know if anyone on the working group is, is identified as a philosopher, though. So um, that's, that's the answer to your question, is certainly we have no intent to exclude anyone. I think um, academics are probably the people that would be the most close to that, that question that you asked. Yeah, and of course, there are people other than this list, but these are people particularly empowered in the decision-making process that are identified. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, many. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is it possible that this will be an impressive effort will not reach a satisfying conclusion? Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, sorry, yes, thank you for the reminder. Yes, is it possible that this effort will not reach a satisfying conclusion? Yes, I think it is not, I think a reasonable expectation 
that everyone will be satisfied with the result. I don't think that's reasonable because for the reasons I said that there are truly valid, mm -hmm. valid perspectives that are completely at odds with each other. And that's one of the reasons we're using this co-design piece to, to try to weave together the perspectives to a great extent as possible. But yes, there, there definitely will be people that are dissatisfied, uh, moderately satisfied, satisfied. It will be a Likert scale <laughs> and some people will truly hate it. And, and that is, I think, yeah. Yeah, for example, one, yeah. One, uh, one very, like, it, the debate is about, shall we use only open data? So you train your model on something, does it have to be copyrighted? I don't know. Uh, I think on the first, when I introduced to this question, I said, of course. And then, wait, then we don't have any open source model in, in the world because we don't have enough uh, copyrighted data for sure for open source models. So it's like, it's a balance and the, the answer, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, many will not be satisfied, but I hope uh, some others will. Uh, not in the required list, and I believe also not in the optional list, but we're using effectively your organization's list. So do you also want to comment on that? So, but uh, so the data also, the training data is also mm -hmm. part of it. Uh, the question is whether the training data will be, uh, will have to be open or not. This is something that uh, currently it seems that it will not have to be open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. I would say Wait, the questions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what would be a mark of success for this project? So I will speak out of school a little bit because I'm not working for OSI, but um, uh, directly. I would say um, that it has the same level of adoption as the OSD, as the open source definition, which is a very mm -hmm. high level of success, which is basically, I mean, you could even probably speak to that more than I could, um, but just that people are basically confidently and comfortably relying on this, this standard set by OSI for open source AI. Yeah, there, there is a confusion in the market for sure. Mm -hmm. So people uh, uh, release stuff and they say it's open source, where it's not really open source. Uh, first of all, because there is no open source definition, but also because it's really not open source, even with classical definitions. Uh, so uh, um, wide adoption of the, uh, of the uh, licenses and the definitions that we, we, the group is, is, is defining, that would be a success. Yeah, boring, reliable public infrastructure would be the goal. Yeah, oh, I love that. <laughs> More questions? Yes. I'll repeat it, I'll repeat it, and then I think maybe you can answer it. Can, can you comment on how copyright plays into all this? So you train a model and you want to open source it. Basically, when you train a model on the data, you, you produce like weights and then you run your model. The output, the output of the model can be um, copyrighted because you trained on a copyrighted uh, data, right? So basically, whether your model can produce copyrighted data or uh, outcomes, it's a little bit uh, problematic. Have you guys thought about uh, you know, uh, thinking outside the box? Outside the box of the traditional definition, definition of open source? Hmm. And also the, the existing uh, copyright regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. autonomous yeah, have we considered
explore some, you know, uh, maybe potential to redefine re or reimagine mm. the open source mm -hmm. mission as far as I can imagine the upland team. Just a follow on to that. Oh. Did you mean that we fit copyright altogether? I'm not saying either combine it or reject it. I'm just, you know, provide some kind of a proof of thought. So I'll just repeat that. In summary, in summary, <laughs> I think the question was, um, have we thought of thinking outside the box of existing definitions of open source and copyright regimes? And there were some examples given in there as well. Do you want to start? I mean, I can. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. We are looking for as close as we can get to consensus, and I think. The path towards that is what are the things that we can already agree on? And it seemed like, for example, the four, uh, freedoms. the four freedoms was what can we all agree on as a foundation for open source AI. And so we went forward with that because there are so many novel challenges specific mm -hmm. to AI and also specific to open source AI. Yes. We said, let's start with values we can all agree on. Um, and also to the extent that we can build on existing still valid licensing regimes and legal frameworks, let's do that because there's so much new territory. It's like, let's, let's stand on the land that's already <laughs> in the water effectively. Um, do you want to add to that? No, I, I agree. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's pretty complex uh, even with the existing definitions mm -hmm. and, and ground. Yeah, these are very fun def uh, questions, by the way. Thank you all. It seems like the biggest difference right now between the models that are being called open and this definition is under the freedom to use the system for any purpose. So there are restrictions on how you can use some of the models that are available openly right now without due notice. So are you yeah, I'll take it. Should there be slight restrictions on size that say, yes, we're not going to do this, even though we could under the terms of this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. so, so this is a question about use and specifically use restrictions in the, uh, in the definition. Um, so I, I would like to disagree with your, uh, with your statement. So study is also part of it. So we have use, study, modify, and share. Mm -hmm. So. All the four are a little bit uh, uh, controversial because uh, use and, and where I can use, this is one element of open source, but study is also an important element. And if you provide a model and you say it's open, but you don't give the documentation, you don't give the, the, the training uh, uh, code, you don't give all the elements, you can study it. So um, there are... Yeah, if, if you're looking at the commercial use, yes, and, and when you look at like uh, study universities, research around the models, which is very important if we want to get into alignment and if you want to get into responsible AI, we want to, to, uh, uh, to develop uh, all of the uh, security aspects, it's really important to provide the, the means to study as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, when we did these co-design sessions on the terms, uh, there was some proposals to limit use, so effectively to strike this any purpose, but ultimately the participants decided that is so core to open source, the any purpose um, designation that we kept it. But yes, um, for reasons that you've stated, like defakes and other issues, it, it, it was part of the discussion. So I'll respond to that, and then I do want to move on to the next question. Are we going to make recommendations? At this point, uh, we are focused on the definition. So it will be this, use the system for any purpose without 
asking for permission, and then uh, once we finish with this in October, then we'll move on to other policy questions, which are obviously also important. Yeah, okay, we wanted to, to yeah. have an, one more uh, slide here mm. and uh, to discuss maybe the a little bit controversial uh, question. Should we open source AI? Actually, the, in fact, uh, AI is already open sourced in, in, in different way, but there is a discussion, uh, uh, like global discussion now, whether AI is too dangerous, so we should keep it closed, or should, or on the other end, it's so important, so we should keep it open. So uh, we would love to hear your opinion theory about that. Yeah, Joe. So um, there are arguments, or there are, there are people, and, and important people in the AI world, that claim that um, closed AI is better than open AI because you can restrict the companies in a much easier way. So when you open source a model, and everyone can use it and, and uh, play with it and, and create new uh, uh, um, use cases with it, new tools, maybe it's dangerous. Yes. I think there are places for both. Open AI and cloud AI. And just think about like the uh, uh, analogy, like uh, iOS versus Android. There are places for both. Yeah. I agree. More more uh, so there is place for both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to run the massive LLM models. And on the other end of a extreme spectrum, you have independent software developers that believe passionately in open source as a leveling agent in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And on that extreme hyperscaler side, the argument is, yes, government regulators we agree there should be some regulation, not too much, mm -hmm. but these technologies um, do represent a risk and we need our platforms anyway. So come to one, two, or three maybe hyperscalers and we will keep you safe. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly the argument. On the other extreme, there's the statement that says, are you effing kidding me? <laughs> Yes. And could uh, encryption in the early internet was viewed as so important and so strategic that it should not be shared in open source? That's exactly the, the same discussion again. And, this, and so here's the echo. And ultimately, the decision was that this software in encryption is a digital public good. And just like what was proved in the last week, with XZ, that because it was available to be reviewed and seen by many eyes, fortunately an engineer happened upon it and found it. So there's still obviously a lot of yeah. discussion to happen. But yeah, so we need to, to finish in, 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 yeah. a minute, in a minute, but basically I, I put some of the arguments here. Mm. You can see it. Uh, uh, 
which is? Yes and no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it's outside of the scope of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, I'll just go to the next. This. Yeah, so um, just uh, uh, to get you involved, I mm. put here, we put here many QR codes. So mm. uh, the generative AI commons on the left, this, <laughs> is, uh, this is our um, organization. Uh, you can please go there, join us, and, and, and review all the resources. We have many blogs. We have many uh, 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 webinars that we are running. Um, the next webinar, which is to this uh, audience, is here in the center. So this is the one that any here is, is moderating. I will be participating in this. Uh, the get, Getting Started Guide, if you want to join us, this is how to, to do it. Our LinkedIn's. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have, and this is, this is uh, my, my question to you, we have a developer's sur survey here. This is something that we put together as part of the Generative AI Common, uh, as part of my education and outreach uh, committee. Uh, we would like to educate um, the developers on open source AI, because in many cases, developers don't know how, how much they have out there, and we want to understand their needs, your needs, if you are developers. Please answer the survey and provide more feedback so we can build the right content uh, and the right uh, yeah, content and education for you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Have a good lunch. <laughs> yeah, enjoy the lunch. <laughs> yeah, that's it.